Oh, I'm never gonna get tired of hearing recording in progress. Really? Babe. Are you uh, really never? Not at all. Like not no. ten years from now. Okay. Will you years. still be like this is the best thing ever? Okay, maybe not. Not ten years from now, because they'll probably be saying something different. Like re recording started, and it's gonna get on my nerves oh, completely. My I'm gonna be like recording in progress was just posh. Was just posh. Well, I'm was like, just posh. Like where are these words coming from? I'm trying. Just, just posh. Well, I, I can't even. You know what? I can't. I'm not you doing it today. Up with the and, word I can't, and I can't <laughs> even like I can't even hold the book today because you know I sprained my oh, thumb. Oh, that's right. You oh, know. my right hand. I was so annoyed. Anyway, we wrote literary life guides with pop poetry. Yes, y'all. Sometimes we have wise things to say, or just our co-authors do, and we just write anyway. anyway. It, All right. So, the and book. I thought the voice was bad with other life lessons, and I thought being grown up was easy. If only I were me a memoir in verse. And I'm gonna just go in one of my favorite books. Yes, we're not supposed to have favorite books, but I do. Okay, so, and I thought I did my journey alone, and then we're going to go with, yeah, you can check out all the stuff on W. What? 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 Well, no, no, what? She cut out my books by myself. I did. No, I did. And I did it on purpose, too, just to see if she recognized it. She totally did. And I, you can find out everything you ladies are doing on www.andithoughtladies.com. We have a co-host today, Tanya. Hi, this is Tanya Todd. I am an author, actress, and the host of the 52 Love podcast. Fabulous. All right. So, so you're professional. I know one day when I grow up. Oh, definitely. When I am like five two, it is gonna be on y'all. So <laughs> professional. So professional. But y'all aren't here to hear about me lying about how short I am. You're actually here to hear for my wonderful guests. Wonderful, wonderful guests. Would you like to introduce yourself? I'm sorry, I jumped in early. Your energy is just totally infectious, even though I've already had a long day. My name's Ella Wakatama. And um, three things about me. I really love cats. Yes. It's really important to know that I'm a cat lady. I, wow. <laughs> I really believe that it's wrong to eat other animals. Um, so I'm an African vegan. And the third thing is I'm deeply, truly, and forever devoted to Tina Turner. Fantastic. Oh my <laughs> God. Well, I just feel like, I feel like maybe, just maybe like we were to me because I, I love cats. Yeah, good. good and good. I love Tia Turner. Like Tia Turner is life. Like, and we just went vegan. Yeah. So, I mean, Tia Turner is life though. How can you, you couldn't, you can, I can't live without Tia Turner. She's on all of my exercise lists. Like, everywhere. She's on all of her playlists. Don't let her all the playlists. It's all what's your favorite Tina song? It changes, but really what's love got to do with it? Nice. And um, I could, well, I'm going to now start listing all of them. But yeah, I think that's the one that I'd always come back to. I love it. that when they do this. I want to try to <laughs> that, that is just, that's amazing. And I just love it. I, I just, okay, I had actual serious questions. And now. Just ask about Tina's cats and, um, <laughs> yeah, literally. Like, oh, wait, before we get into serious things, do you mind me asking a non serious question? Favorite What's vegan that? recipe? Well, do you know, I'm from Zimbabwe and um, I've been a vegan for a long time before you could find vegan food in the supermarket. So I ended up cooking a lot of traditional Zimbabwean food because um, when people are living in villages, they don't eat meat every day because you're raising your own livestock. So you can't eat it every day. And so and we also don't eat very much dairy. And so Zimbabwean food, sadza, which is made from cornmeal, muriwa vegetables, um, and lots of peanut butter in our vegetables. And so I think my favorite vegan staples are all traditional Zimbabwean foods. Okay, well now I have now Googling to do. No. So I'm you excited. <laughs> I have Googling. We're gonna be looking for a recipe book. Yeah, we're we're Bible, so we will. I'm it's gonna be on. No? I'm so excited. All right, so. Okay, that was real question. So you work for Canning Gate. What kind of uh, what kind of work does Canning Gate pride itself on putting into the world? Okay, so my job is editor at large for Canning Gate. It's um, I hope my last job in publishing. I never want to leave. Um, I came here through very various routes. We specialize in books that start conversations, and want I guess we are known for being really brave and innovative and sometimes taking huge risks. Um, to give an example, one of the two books that everyone will recognize that we took a punt on when nobody else was, the first was Jan Mattel's The Life of Pi, which went on to be huge. 
And the second was Dreams from My Father by Barack Obama, Mr. Mm -hmm. President. So we were his first UK publishers. So those kinds of books. And for me, I, um, it's really wonderful being editor at large because it's not my full-time job, but it means that I can bring in titles I'm really passionate about. I'm yeah, I was going to ask, what does it mean to have that title editor at large? How is that different from other editors? That's a great question. It doesn't mean I get a red velvet cape, although I have been asking. <laughs> I think <it> <laughs> a little bit of Ankara on the edges. But anyway, um, it means that I'm brought in, I guess, sort of at quite a senior specialist level um, to develop a list of books. It has to be a list that kind of is in conversation with other Canongate books. But really, it's about bringing my expertise and my areas of focus into the company. And so throughout my career, I've been focused quite, I guess, quite ferociously so on publishing writers of color, specifically Black, even more specifically African writers. And then a whole wide range. But, you know, when I started working publishing about 20 years ago, you could find, if you went into the bookstore, you would go to the back of the bookstore because the the Blacks and the um, you know, LGBTQ and science fiction were all in the back. And that's what I wanted to read. But I also felt that I wanted those books to be interspersed amongst the other books that I wanted to read. So that has been, I guess, my personal project. And right now, what I'm really most interested in are books by people who in the past have been on the margins. Um, there aren't enough books telling us about the lives of Black men in the mm -hmm. UK, for example, that's improving. Um, we're not hearing enough from queer people. Um, it, writing about things that aren't necessarily about identity. When you're Black, you don't always want to write about being Black. Sometimes you want to write about flowers and trees and animals, right? right? Um, when you are queer, you don't always want to write about your queer identity. Sometimes you want to write about flowers and animals and trees and war, all of those things. So I focus on finding those kinds of stories. And I'm also really interested in writers who create a form to tell the story they need to tell. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the novel and its inception as a kind of like a very British way of storytelling, that's not going to be big enough to house the story, let's say, of a queer Black woman growing up in Nigeria. Something new has to be created to hold that story. and. I really see my job or my mission as to find the writers who are innovating in that way and also to help them do it. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, love I love the fact that you said sometimes you have to invent a form to tell a story. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Well, it's personally amazing to us. I know it's amazing <laughs> to us. Because, uh, we, we write to the form to we tell write our pop poetry. So yeah, that's, <laughs> that's not a thing. And we write yeah, it very it often. It is a thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, just to give you an example, one of my new writers um, has just written a book called Stay Woke Kids. Her name is Kajare Knox, and I really love her work because she's on Instagram a lot and she does really great pop, pop culture designs. She's written limericks that all have to do with race and gender, inclusion, exclusion, cultural appropriation. They're funny as heck, and they're also really biting and incisive. Mm -hmm. And her illustrations are great. And so for me, that was a really wonderful way that a young Black woman wanted to um, be quite political in that way, but to be playful with it as well. And I think for me, I guess that that politics is always at the heart of everything, even if it's a love story, if it's one of my books, it's going to have politics in it. Wow. Wow. That's I, amazing. I feel like Tanya needs to ask a question now. Yes, so, yes. So we can, Let's we can be, to Tanya real quick. So we can be still professional. Tanya. <laughs> I'd like you to tell us about the program you did last spring called Novel Voices. Oh, okay. That was such fun. I'm glad you brought that up. One of my other jobs is as a senior research fellow at the University of Manchester in the School of Creative Writing, the Center for New Writing, rather. Um, I had been doing a series called The Complete Works, in which I talked to writers having read everything they'd written, every book they'd ever written. And that went really well. I loved it. I was learning so much. 
um, and getting to spend time with writers I really love. And then the pandemic happened, so we could no longer do live events. We could no longer fly in writers from anywhere. And I think what's a way to sort of continue doing these conversations with writers? Um, and I thought about how much I love debuts. There's nothing like picking up the phone to a new writer and saying, I want to buy your book. You know, it's like, you know, you're changing the world. It's like magic. So I wanted to spend time talking to writers. And I also, you know, I gave you a real um, description of the writers I'm interested in. I wanted to feature those writers in a way they're not featured in other interviews. Other interviews focus too much on their identity and they try to make every work autobiographical. As a writer, your job is to imagine, and because you're a writer of color, because you are a, a writer from other marginalized communities, doesn't mean that everything has to come from your life experience. You create, you're an artist. So um, I put together pairs of writers who I thought would go really well together. Um, and then I talked to them about craft, about writing, about the act of being a writer, about the act of writing and where their stories came from, not, what's it like to be a gay writer from Texas, you know? So it I mean, sounds like it went well. Will you do it again? Yes, I'm busy planning the current one now. My assistants and I are looking through various um, manuscripts and so on. I mean, two of the writers we featured went on to be shortlisted for major awards. So we felt nice. like we want to do it again. And it's a way of us, I mean, you know, in all the advertising, we just say these are the top voices to be looking out for no caveats, no explanations about there'll be more than one Black person or right. you know, anything like that, yeah. So speaking of major awards, you've served as a judge for the Man Booker Prize. What goes into consideration when reviewing work for something like that? It's a, an amazing prize because each judge has to read every book. And so we ended up, I think in my year, we read something like 134 books in a year. Wow. Which was wonderful because I've been a book a year person for, since I could read, I guess. A book a year, a book a day. A book a year is nothing, but a book a day person. And so, you know, in this instance, I was actually, like, my work was reading everything published that year. What goes into consideration, you know, that really changes every single year because you're responding to each book. And what, what happens is that because there's such a variety in the judging panel, you're all picking up different things. I mean, I read as an editor um, professionally, mm -hmm. but my colleague who's a poet is gonna read in a different way. The magic happens in the discussions and the arguments. And you see very quickly that some books just rise to the top. And so it gets harder and harder as you come to the end. The year I judged, we were unanimous because that book was astonishing. And that was Marlon James's A Brief History of Seven Killings. Talk about finding a new form. Yes, yes, yeah. wow. Yeah. Wow, yeah, that's- I had the pleasure of meeting him here in Vegas. He was here for oh, the Believer did. Festival, yeah. He's fantastic. He's, he had, he's very dynamic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like everything that you were involved in is just innovative and cutting edge of the literary form. Yes. Um, Jade, do you actually have a question? Well, I was gonna ask, because we're coming to the end of the show, what are some uh, key advice that you would give to new creators out here that are trying to just walk in their own path? This is something I wish I'd known at the beginning. Don't try to fit in. You know, in, in the places we live, we're in the diaspora. And I think even sometimes if we're still living on the African continent as well, we try to fit into a professional mode or a, a creative mode. There's, you know, the canon is supposed to be this thing. As soon as I realized that trying to fit myself into whatever that kind of um, square box was, was going to fail and decided that I was just going to do what I needed to do. Everything started changing for me. And you have to think about what you bring yourself. What are you bringing? You're bringing rich cultural heritage as a person of color, regardless of where you come from. You're bringing journeys, you're bringing survival, you're bringing resilience. And, you know, all of us here, we're speaking sort of, you know, standard English and we have all of those references. And I know that when we speak to our families, our voices have a different tone to them, have a different um, music to them that's for our families or for other communities of color. That is really valuable. No, you know, your, your companions won't have it. So you can't throw away that, that, that bundle that your ancestors have gifted you 
of things that you know, because you know more than one world. And that is incredibly valuable. Don't try to be like anybody else and be yourself. And, you know, know what you're worth. <laughs> that, that, that is amazing. amazing. <laughs> I was like, okay, will we'll ever appoint to anybody end. else that like a little me. bit in love right now? Right. <laughs> it was from the beginning when she was like, right. Kat, it's a it was I know. Like, oh. like, it was just, you had me at cat. So, <laughs> yeah, you did. You did. You had me at cat. <laughs> okay. So, where can people um check out more of your, your, um, more Nona. of what Canongate has put out into yep. the world. So, you know, let's increase book sales. Yeah. Or any, yeah. any conferences or appearances that you might be at that people would want to attend. Yeah, I'm doing, I mean, right this weekend is the Penn Festival. Um, Penn is the organization that helps writers um, in political trouble mostly. And I am interviewing writers talking about science fiction freedom featuring, because science fiction is the other love of my life, although I don't do much science fiction publishing, but... I think that it's a natural form for people of color, really. And so I'm interviewing a couple of writers on that, thinking about freedom of expression. Um, Canongate has a wonderful website. I'm really part of all of the books that we do. I would point you specifically, Antonia, if you love um, Marlon James, his friend Kai Miller has a new book out um, in the United States, published by Grove, called Things I Have Withheld, which is exquisite. Mm. Exquisite. It's a, a collection of essays. I feel um, I feel a fall reading coming on. Like I have a fall <laughs> read going on. I feel like it's just come out in America. It is an extraordinary book about what it is we hold inside ourselves and we don't say out loud and the cost of that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'm totally, totally reading that book. I'm excited. I'm excited now. All <laughs> right, thank you so much for coming on, Tanya. Where can people find out more about you? I am across social media at Ms. Tanya Todd. You can find me on IMDb. Just look up Tanya Todd and I, my podcast, the 50 on Spotify. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, we were going to pause until she said the IMDb. <laughs> we're going to be like, we're waiting for it. All right. I'll go ahead and wrap and it just up. To, just in case y'all wanted to know why we wait for it, you need to click on that, which means that her number goes higher. She can get hired. Jobs for Tanya. We're excited. It's a little more complicated than that. <laughs> I'm sure it is. We're oversimplifying it, Tanya. We're oversimplifying it. We're trying it. to do our bit. Right. Our part. I appreciate you. Thank all you. right. All right. Jane, so, would you like yeah, to wrap Absolutely. Up? You can find out everything your ladies are doing on www.andithoughtladies.com. While you're there, take a moment, go to the bottom and see the charities that we proudly represent. Okay. Yep, yeah. that works for me. Wow. I don't know what's going on today. And we hope you can help them too. We thank you in advance for that. And just remember, y'all, wisdom is all around you if. You're open to finding it and accepting it. So peace and love, you guys. From Will Nona. And Jade, bye-bye. Oh, yeah, thanks for listening.